Good morning. Taylor Hemmings here from 41 Action News with another episode of Faith in KC. You know, they say on the, the Room Raiders and things, you're supposed to have greenery in the background. So I thought I'd sit out here in the lobby of 41 Action News Station with our with our plants in the background because I normally don't have any greenery behind me. Um, and it's too cold to be outside, frankly. We've talked a little bit about, in recent episodes, um, difficulties that people have had lately. Um, that, that run out of gas feeling. And I've, I've shared that I've, during some of these conversations, I have definitely felt that way. Um, recently, I felt like uh, I wanna put something down out of all my responsibilities, whether it be um, work-related or family-related sometimes, um, church-related, definitely. Um, not, not feeling like you can do all the things that you should be able to do or that you're normally able to do, however you want to word it. Um, and I've been able to, I feel like, effectively and appropriately do that with a couple of things lately. Uh, but I got to thinking about what it would be like if that was not an option. And obviously with family related, whether it be your spouse or your parenting, uh, that's not really an option. But um, the things that you can't put down because of the number of other people who are depending on you. And that's why uh, this conversation is happening today. I, I wanted to uh, talk about the work done by nonprofits uh, with a faith-based background. And that's why I'm, I'm speaking with Catholic Charities of Kansas City and St. Joseph today, the, that chapter and their uh, CEO, Karen Knoll. I, I, I can't imagine the, the pressure of knowing that such a large group of people depend on you for something so vital. The only thing I have to compare it to at all is that maybe there's a large group of viewers that depend on me or depend on my station to deliver news to them. But that is, frankly, a drop in the bucket compared to food or housing or clothing or any number of things that some of these nonprofit agencies, these faith-based agencies uh, provide to people every day. And some of the things that Karen has to say about the eye-opening process this has been for her of the number of people in need and what in need uh, looks like and how it's changed over the last few months is, is really incredible for her to share. So. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation. I know I say that every week, but I, I do. I, I love having these conversations. I hope you do too. Uh, as always, please uh, leave your comments. If you're watching this on Facebook, let us know what you think or who else we should speak to. Um, you can find me at, uh, you can email me at taylor.hemness at kshb.com, but you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook as well. Um, reach out and tell me what you think and who else I should be talking to and, uh, you may have noticed, I hope you've noticed that we've now gone to every other week instead of every week on these episodes, but they're still going to be coming out every other week on Sunday mornings, and I'll have uh, more coming soon. But for now, I, I hope you enjoy this episode and, and the thought process behind not only people in need, but the people who are there to help them uh, and can't ever stop. Well, hello. Welcome to another edition of Faith in KC. Taylor Hemmings here from 41 Action News. Glad to be coming with you with another episode today. Uh, looking forward to the conversation today because we're going to be talking about giving. We've talked about giving in a lot of the previous episodes, um, and we want to continue that conversation today. One, because it's an uh, important thing that so many people are doing and needing right now. Uh, and two, because it's an important tenet of, of so many faiths, not just Christianity, um, but so many faiths uh, have, have that as an important of, of the way they, they worship and observe their faith. So I'm glad today to be joined by Karen Knoll. She's the CEO of Catholic Charities of Kansas City, St. Joseph. And uh, Karen, I'm really glad you're able to take some time out of what I'm sure is a very busy schedule. Thanks for joining me today. Taylor, thank you so much. Um, it's a lovely opportunity to come and talk about Catholic Charities of Kansas City and St. Joseph. We appreciate you asking us to join. Sure. So when you tell people what you do, um, I'm the CEO of Catholic Charities here in the Kansas City area. One, what is the response to that? Because everybody gets a response when you tell people what you do and where you work. And two, how do you explain for people that aren't familiar what Catholic Charities does? You know, we are a faith-based human services agency, and it's a complete blessing. I came from the corporate world, and with the, your question about what is the response um, working at Catholic Charities 
it, overwhelmingly the meaningfulness of what the mission is. Um, it just truly really is a blessing. I get out of bed every day, excited to come to work because this, not only what we do, but the people we do it with, this staff is com the compassion, the skill, their can-do attitude. They do it with grace. And I, um, I just feel completely blessed to be here. Obviously, yours is not the only organization that is um, based in, or the, the goal is to, to give to people and to, to be charitable. And also not the only one of those organizations that comes from a faith background or a, or a faith uh, foundation, I'll, I'll say. What yeah. differentiates Catholic Charities um, from maybe some of the organizations people are familiar with or what, what's, what's different about Catholic Charities? That's a great question. Um, so our mission is to serve and to lift. And we serve the most vulnerable in the community, which others do as well. We serve that moment of crisis, which others do as well. What makes us different is that we then take and wrap around a lot of um, services that help to lift the individuals and the families to the dignity of self-reliance. We provide um, financial literacy, we provide workforce development. We look at those triggers that drove or are contributing to that point of crisis. And when the individual is ready, we want to help them. We build in all this around them to bring them up to where they can take care of their family on, on their own. And that's the dignity. And so we really are a big proponent of serving all our brothers and sisters in need and then helping them lift them to a, a, a new position. You've got a map you wanted to show. I'll ask you to pull it up because, um, yeah. as I said, you're the CEO of Catholic Charities Kansas City St. Joseph, but there are actually two chapters of Catholic Charities here in the Casey Viewing area, right? Correct. That is correct. So this was just a nice little visual just to show we, we are uh, interesting because they're, the Catholic Charities is across the country. Um, actually, Catholic Charities is the largest um, social service provider in the USA behind the government. So the federal government is larger than Catholic Charities, but Catholic Charities is second. But mm -hmm. in our area, we are blessed to have two Catholic Charities. And it's, it's interesting because some people um, get a little confused. We have this artificial line or we have the state line and that's a demarcation. So we have Northeast Kansas, Catholic Charities of Northeast Kansas, it's on the Kansas side. And then we have Catholic Charities of Kansas City, St. Joseph on the Missouri side. And altogether we have about you know, 2.8 million people that we serve. Um, of that, the poverty levels are somewhat similar. They're higher on the Missouri side. We have about 50,000 uh, more people in poverty on the Missouri side than Kansas. And we are all here to raise our brothers and sisters in need um, some of the differences are that on the Missouri side, we have housing initiatives and we house seniors and veterans and um, those impoverished, on, whereas on the Kansas side, they focus on hospice. And so all good missions, there's just not en never enough hands, but this is sure. kind of gives an idea of the two um, Catholic charities in our region. Can you... Karen, can you, and if, if the answer is, that's that's hard to come by. If, that, if, if this is a, a weird question to get you to answer, I apologize. But can you give me an indication of on a given day, how many people are being helped by your organization? Do you keep track of that down to that specific number? You know what? It actually is cyclical by the day. Um, with COVID, we've seen such an increase. I mean, it, it was... It is continually an increasing um, challenge. We have seen, for instance, on the days we give out emergency assistance, we do it a few days a week. Those days we are flooded. We have 1,800 calls in some, on, on specific days, <laughs> people coming from all 27 counties trying to facilitate need. And the challenge for us is that we, um, so, so I'll give an example to put this in context. So. In a general year, we give out about a million dollars in emergency service. That means for rent and utilities, I'm being evicted, so I need help. I, I can't pay my water bill. I can't pay my electric bill. 
Um, so we give out about a million dollars in service in a typical year. In October, November, December, fourth quarter, we gave out 1.2 million. So the volume is just rising exponentially. And we were only able to serve about 25% of the calls that came in, the appointments that were set. And so the need is much bigger even than what we can facilitate. So. Karen, you, you, you can hop up back full screen. Thank you for sharing that map. I, I appreciate it. Uh, I, you can't help everyone, obviously. Right. And when you have that many people that are calling, that are coming to you, um, how do you, how do you, how do you do that? Like, I mean, how, when you've got finite resources and potentially infinite feeling almost number of people who need those resources, how do you parse out? This is what we're doing with this. How, how do you make those decisions? Yeah. I mean, before, before COVID there was about 38 million people in poverty in the U S and now there's, um, there was 34 and now there's 38. So there's about 4 million more in poverty. Yeah. The way we're able to facilitate, and this is, you know, I would love to change this, but it's really first come first serve. And it's, that's heart wrenching yeah. because if we're able to help 10 and then number 11, 12 come in and it's, do you know that image of the starfish on the beach? Have you, you seen that image yeah. where there's yeah. starfish all on the beach? And I think about that. I'm like, oh, and the little boy is running. He's tossing this starfish to save them. And I'm thinking, okay, he, he tells him he can't save everybody, but he can save those few. And that's like, yeah. how feel, but I'm like, there's a lot of starfish we still have to save. Um, so we do, it's first come first serve. And we have seen the need grow so much with COVID um, due to a lot of loss of jobs. And that's yeah. one of the situational poverty triggers. There's you know, generational poverty and there's situational poverty. So the big drivers of situational poverty are medical debt and actually divorce and yeah. loss, loss of job. For if, if someone is watching, and I, I would imagine that most people of a, of a faith background, that's because that's typically who watches a lot of these. But uh, if, if you're not familiar with the story that Karen was just referencing, the, I think the, the end line of it is when someone asked the little boy, what are you doing? This It doesn't matter. And the little boy says, it matters to that one that I just threw. Uh, back into the water when he's throwing those starfish back in. Um, I want to talk to you about, because obviously you can't do it alone and, all, and do it in your, your building there for, for Catholic Charities. You depend on people being able to help out. Um, how, do you, how do you kind of facilitate when a person, an organization, a church, whoever comes to you and says, we'd like to help. I'd like to give such and such. I mean, do you, do you consider yourself almost sometimes a conduit from, from getting this to this when, when the people come forward and want to help? No, Taylor, that's actually really profound because we do. We, we, one of the things I've, I've told the team, we are the great connector. We, we just can, we connect, we connect resources, whether they're hands, you know, people are wanting to donate, you know, their time. We connect um, talent. We connect dollars to. I mean, so we we are a connector to those in need. And when if someone wants to volunteer, we have you know that was one of the key um, initiatives when I started was we need more and more opportunities for volunteers because we are called to um, one of our key missions is to give our fellow Christians or people of goodwill opportunities to share their faith um, with their family too. And, and we are taught that, hey, I will give to those in need. And, um, you know, Jesus said, I'm hungry. You gave me food. I'm thirsty. You gave me drink. We are here to, to facilitate ways for people to volunteer. So there are very few areas in our metro in our community where moms and dads and kiddos can all come together and volunteer and we've made a lot of opportunities for those individuals whether it's our food pantries whether it's to do hygiene kits like put little toothpaste and and yeah. all those we make hundreds and hundreds of kits um for emergency services and so all those different opportunities so people can come in because i'll tell you some of the best healing if you are not feeling happy if you are sad come in and volunteer for somebody else come in and give your time and that is a very self-healing in so many ways, so many ways. 
I was going to ask you about that next because um, I, I don't mind saying I've experienced that. I uh, both from volunteering for church situations as a member of my church, or we we do volunteer situations here at work where we go and work at uh, harvesters or whatever we're going to go do. Um, I've had opportunities to to volunteer, and it absolutely is um, a phenomenal feeling that warm and fuzzy that you're that you're supposed to get. I think. Um, how much harder would Catholic Charities' job be if the people were not there to to get that warm and fuzzy? If if you don't have people that are, in many cases, exercising part of their faith in action yeah. to come and do what they're going to do, how much harder does the job with Catholic Charities become? Exponentially. I mean, it is. We are here to to um, help people be the hands and feet of Christ. And yeah. without all the, the community, it is truly a community effort. It cannot be anything but. And I think it's the Holy Spirit coming in and giving you that warm and fuzzy. And that's that was my own personal thinking, because you know, giving for others, it, it just is. Again, it is a healing. It's a calm, and it's a the beta endorphins are there. Um, but we are called to give our brothers and sisters a reason to help. And how can they live their faith? So it is a critical piece to have volunteers for us. Um, for, for many reasons, many reasons. I'm assuming it does, you don't have to be a person of faith to get help from Catholic Charities, right? Like that's, that's not a requirement by any means. No, 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 no. In fact, every, you know, less than, goodness, like 8% walk in are Catholic. I mean, the, so um, we have every faith. We don't even ask. You walk in, you walk through our doors, we provide service. It takes yeah. a lot courage to walk through our doors or anyone's doors to ask for help. It takes a lot of courage. And, and Taylor, one thing I was just so profoundly moved by um, this summer when we gave out the, some CARES monies for utilities and rent assistance was, was the physicality of the burden. So people try, coming in and you could just see the, the burden and the physicality of the, of that. And, and, uh, it's, it's very profound, but you do not, you know, we don't ask, please come. We will help. If you are in need, we are here to help. That's our mission. This is an odd question too. It just came to me and I apologize if it's, if it's odd to you too, but do you, do you notice a difference in recipients who maybe are or are not believers or members of a faith community? Like, do you, and if, if the answer is no, the answer is no, but I'm, I'm curious about I know how it feels from, from the giver standpoint. Thank God I've never been in a situation where I needed a charitable organization to, to help me out or help my family out of a situation. But I'm, I'm curious about people who um, maybe don't call themselves a, a member of a faith community mm -hmm. receiving something from someone who is. Do you, do you notice any kind of differences or, or similarities even between the, the two recipients? Um. I can't say I I have experienced it. I don't know. Really, they don't ask their faith, so I'm not really yeah. sure. But, but I mean, there's so many people that are grateful. I, I just it's sure. that's across the kind of all. Um, so that's kind of hard to answer. No, it's it's okay. It just kind of like I said, it kind of popped up in my head, and I wanted to because, like I said, I think a lot of people, especially people who will watch this, can put themselves in the in the shoes of the giver but maybe not the recipient. Um, maybe a better question would be, how do people respond when they are given to? You, you talked about how people respond when they get the chance to give. Yeah. How do people respond when they're given to? Well, that's a great, that's a good question too, because um, we were talking about our programmatics and part of our programmatics at the end of our, their journey, and they graduated for lack of a better term, yeah. and they're at, self-reliance, we ask them to come back and give to others. And so, and that's really a lot of our staff, <laughs> a lot of our volunteers have become staff, a lot of our, so it is a cycle of goodwill. It is a cycle of goodwill. And, and you know, we've, we've heard that energy begets energy, you know, goodwill begets goodwill. Yeah. It is a cycle and it is a circle. Um, and it's a lot of, I mean, it is very emotional. So we do a lot of food drives or services, a lot of tears of joy, a lot of tears of just um, relief. 
Um, so, and they feel compelled to give as well, which we love. We love. Yeah. So, but there, um, let me give you an example. So, Kayla, here's one. Please. So, poverty, and I kind of always wonder well, what does poverty really mean? And we're not a third world country. We're not, you know, we're very blessed in many ways, but the definition or a way to think about it is anyone like under $26,000, like annual income. So a family of four. So think of a mom and dad and two kiddos or usually mom and three kiddos. So 26, that you have three kiddos, don't you? I do. Yes. So, so think of your boys <laughs> and trying to feed them housing, clothing, transportation, utilities, medical care. Yeah. You know, one of them swings, jumps off the swing set, breaks their arm, $1,200, you know, right there. I mean, how do you, a year of 26000 and the average rent is is more than, you know, $1,200 a month out. How do you make that work with four people? My daughter yeah. went through, she grew four inches. I mean, we went through shoes. We go through shoes like crazy. You can't keep these kids in shoes. So imagine if three kiddos and paying for all those things. That's kind of when I ask about what poverty is, that's kind of a way to think about it. Um, yeah. That's the, kind of the definition. Well, I, I will say to not too much of a sidebar, but um, some coworkers and I did go and do a, a thing for harvesters a couple of years ago where you're supposed to go and cook a meal on a certain amount of money or buy a certain amount of, of produce or products from them. And so we, we cooked our meal and they told us afterwards, okay, this is great, but why'd you spend all your money on, on this? Or why did you make the entire bit of what you bought so you could save some back or hold some back? And we were all just kind of going, that doesn't even come into my thought process there. Like I, I, I'm not even, my, my gears aren't working that way necessarily. So that's a, that's a great point that you bring up. Um, something else that you brought up earlier in a previous episode of Faith in KC, a couple of episodes ago, um, I talked to uh, a local imam, my only Muslim guest so far, hope to have more absolutely in the coming weeks and months. But he talked about how how big a part of the the, the Muslim faith is um, is giving. And he described it. We they want to keep people at a certain level. It's not, oh, they need a little something. It's no, this is the level the person should be at to be able to survive. And we're trying to keep them at a certain level whenever we give. You're describing a situation where you're trying to to get people on a on an upward trend almost right like you're you're trying to pe put people on a path where it's sustainable is that a fair way to ask that sustainable yes yes self-reliant yeah yeah is that a is that an idea that is like we were just describing that is hard mm -hmm. to teach if you don't already know it like the idea of being able to Stand on your own two feet, for lack of a better term. Um, yes, and, and mm -hmm. some people come and they are ready. Some are not. It's a it truly is a journey. Um, one of the things that we've identified, like <clears throat> one of the hallmarks of generational poverty, is the lack of financial acumen. The people born with out adequate resources and education. About 43% of the children born into poverty remain into poverty because they don't have that, those resources. They don't know the difference. We're here to educate, to help make those connections um, through workforce development, connecting with employers, giving them new skills, showing them how to budget, new debt management, um, general management, things that no one else has had the time or the you know, in their eco, in their little ecosystem to educate them on. And so we are here to educate. And actually a good thing that's come from COVID, if you want to talk about a good thing, we yeah. arranged our services to where they're virtual. We have some, a lot of services now virtual. So our, all our literacy classes, resume generate, we're pulling people in way outside of our region because we don't charge for any of the content that we provide in our classes and they were all in person before because we're very much hands-on one-on-one and so we're pulling a lot more people from outside of our area where people would charge for this we don't and i'm like that's a blessing in and of itself because now more people are being educated beyond our physical classrooms um so that was that's a nice that's a nice positive thing if you there is a positive from covid 
So yeah. Um, I want to put you on the spot a little bit here, Karen, on a situation in which you have come home and ended your day. Can you tell me about a day that you went, wow, we really did something today? We like a day where you you felt Again, that warm and fuzzy we were talking about. Can you describe for me a day where you really felt like you or your organization um, did something? Yeah. So as part of COVID, we have, um, you know, we've not closed a single day. Um, two, two things really resonated. One was, I don't know, it was a, a, in December. It was like a holiday get together. There's probably two, three dozen other charities together and we're having a zoom call <laughs> and uh these were all leaders of their charities and one thing I was very proud it was a proud moment it was um other than hospitals and our partner at um harvesters and ourselves we were the only ones that stayed open the entire time haven't stopped our services didn't pause our services we've been open every day um for people to come in because babies are born every day and people yeah. comes every day and so we are here every day uh, for people to come in in need. And so I was really proud of the team. I didn't really, it didn't really resonate how important it was and that was a good thing until I was at that event. I'm like, this is significant. And our team has such a can-do attitude. It is, it's amazing. And then there was a second situation. It was a little different, also COVID related surprisingly. Um, but we worked with the USDA. They're, the team is headquartered here in Kansas City and we connected um, and we talked with them at, and they asked about farmers to family. It's a program over the summer when, when we heard about crops were being stranded in the fields and, and just eroding, you know, not being, uh, they were just left to rot in the fields or animals are being, you know, slaughtered and not processed because there wasn't enough people to facilitate the logistics and, and so forth yeah. and so on. So we met with the USDA and they wanted to talk and we helped build that program we help provide because they wanted that last mile. I can I can get these resources out, but I don't have a last mile uh, distribution. I need charities to take them to churches, to communities. The churches know their people. So who's in need? I got to get the food to them. So we help build that program. That's a $3 billion program. And we said, here's all the challenges. We don't have forklifts. We don't have pallets. Our average employee is 50 to 60. And so they can't lift heavy things. So how do you package it in like 20 pound or less? And so all of these things, they created the program around it. And it was, I'm like, wow. So our Kansas City USDA team and the Catholic Charities team came together and we, we helped put some criteria to help that last mile to make sure families got food um, throughout the summer and fall months. And that was one of those aha moments like, wow, we, we didn't just help Kansas City. We helped the country in, in yeah. this. That was, that was an awesome moment. Other side of the coin, still putting you on the spot. I'm good at that. I hope you don't mind. Uh, other side of the coin, I think I know from personal experience, um, the feeling of it's too much. Uh, I told some, I've told some people recently that I feel like my, my body and my head and my soul was, was, built to do this for about eight or nine months. And now here we are in month 10 and 11. And I have found myself feeling kind of emptied out on different days. Um, what have those moments, if you had them, those moments been like for you where you feel overwhelmed? Those, those moments of there's so much need and we can't do everything. What is just from a person of faith, standpoint what is what do those moments feel like for you and and how do you respond wow that's a profound question um there was a, a moment and to be fully transparent honest um my Wait. fully transparent <laughs> my yeah. uh, I can see it knows me they're like oh you have an open book or i follow <laughs> the book but anyway um but it really was uh the first thing that comes to mind is we did, we called it a parish connect. This summer we went out to communities and talked to the parish leadership and ministerial alliances and then local, over 27 counties. We did this long road trip in the middle of COVID. And we 
we found out that you know, the need is, goodness, I thought there would be a difference in need between rural and suburban and urban from our program yeah. that we may need to change our programming. Well, it came back, that wasn't so much the case, but what did come to fruition was that the number one need was housing. The second was family support and education and food insecurity, uh, medical debt, and then underemployment and then unemployment. But number one across rural, suburban and urban was housing. That is a mammoth problem. That is a horrifically large problem. And I'm like, we have a great uh, housing program. We have multiple facilities across our service area, but it's it's like a drop in the bucket. Yeah. And, and this problem is, I mean, think about, I was saying about like the 1940s when you bought a house, it was 20% of your income, your, you know, your yeah. monthly. Today, it averages 40 to 60%. So, so if that's the problem, how do we solve, how do we help those? And as I talked about, the, we spent 1.2 million of just to keep people in their homes in the coldest period of the year. And it's a drop in the bucket. And, and that's what keeps me up at night. How do we, how do we solve this? Do we have the resources? We need, you know, how do we think about it differently? Mm -hmm. And we don't have the answer yet. We we are just constantly seeking and searching for that answer. That's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there is there anything that you turn to that for for comfort in those situations? If you don't mind sharing, if you do, that's okay too. But I mean, I just i I wouldn't ask this question honestly if I wasn't experiencing some of the personal thoughts and feelings I've been experiencing in the last six weeks. It just I feel like I'm I've I've literally run out of gas is what it feels like. And I'm I'm I've been searching for things to yeah. comfort. And it's it's difficult right now. And when you're staring at a problem like you're just describing, I I, I can't imagine um <laughs> not to make you feel bad, but how much how much deeper your your feeling may be feeling than mine. I mean uh, you're you're seeing the problems much more than I am. Well we we're all having fatigue in fact, our case managers are front line. Yeah. With this COVID, think about walking, you know, I think about my burden and I think about them. We have case managers who have walked in and the amount of suicide has increased so much. So your client, um, it, they walk in, they find that someone passed away. I mean, think, and I, I just pray and I pray and I'm like, yeah. oh my goodness, these people feel like they have no other options. They're at their end. Yeah. Self-care is very important this time. Our staff is very, they're resilient, they're can do. We've um, asked much more of them and they've gone out with little care for self um, during COVID to help others. And I'm just like, I am always amazed by their, grace filled love, but it is self-care and we're working too candidly. We're like, how do we, what trainings and what mechanisms? And so we're, we're doing some fun things to keep everybody positive, your light. See that beautiful light will keep coming. You know, we all feel that fatigue. You feel like, oh, that light, I just need to rest. You know, So rest, yeah. let that light continue. Energy begets energy, love begets love. Um, but we do need self-care. <laughs> we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Karen, I can take all day talking to you, but I, I don't want to take your entire morning. I, I do want to ask you a couple other things before I let you go um, from the helper and the helpy standpoint. If First, if someone wants to help Catholic Charities reach out, give, what, what's the best tactic to go about doing that? Well, they can, um, they can go to the website. It's it's catholiccharities-kcsj.org. That's catholiccharities-kcsj.org. So it's Kansas mm -hmm. City St. Joe. Yeah. Or they can call the office at 816-221-4377. What about for someone that needs help? Is it the same thing they need to do if someone is... It watches this and has a, has a way to ask. Is that the same thing they need to do? Both. 
on on the site, they can go the call that number as well. So it's the same number. So yeah, if anyone needs help, and we are actually expanding our location. So we, we hope to be in more locations. That's our goal for 2021. Yeah. Um, so some, some new things coming in the next few months. We're very excited about that. Karen, what's, what's your, uh, you mentioned the, the goal for 2021. What's something that you, as, as we get to New Year's Day 2022, uh, which feels hundreds of years from now, honestly, uh, what, what, what's, what's your prayer that that day looks like for Catholic Charities and for what you're doing? What, what, do, you, what do you pray for the future? My prayer, my, my, you know, I'm a doer. Um, we are all doers. And uh, what I pray that we have completed is an expansion. So right now, due to a lot of reasons, we have a main office in Kansas City and a main in an office in St. Joseph. And a lot of people come in and they call. But the physicality of being present is profound. And so we... Um, are opening due to a very generous gift and donations from thousands of people. It's just been a blessing. Um, we're opening two new locations and we're doing mobile outreach. So we'll be able to do a kind of a hub and spoke methodology where we will have a mobile component and then go out to communities, uh, ministerial alliances in different communities and um, parishes to be able to be at that point where anyone can come um, or, and it'll be like a little remote, uh, Catholic charities on wheels. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, that sounds pretty good. At the end of the year, I want to have at least two locations to be able to then do multiple locations from there. So say a prayer for that, Taylor, say a prayer. <laughs> I'm happy to. Absolutely. Karen Dolph from Catholic Charities in Kansas City, St. Joseph. Karen, thank you for your time. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Taylor. Bye-bye.